Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Philip Blair, and I'm coming to you to talk about um, the blocking of the addiction with cannabidiol. This is ha cannabidiol has some extraordinary properties, and I want to go into how cannabidiol can address almost all forms of addiction through the different pathways that it has available. And it can make a totally successful strategy for protecting people from addictions and actually preventing them in many cases. We'll talk about the burden of disease from addiction, some of the conventional causes and the treatments that are established, some of the endocannabinoid deficiency that's associated with this problem, as well as looking at specific CBD benefits. We'll talk about a little bit of the uh, serving sizes and the management, and I'll open it up for questions. Uh, we lost you, Dr. Blair. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm just in some technical difficulties. If we're looking at the addiction disorders, we're seeing a real spectrum of different types of problems. Technically, addiction has to do with not only the drugs, but also behaviors and uh, foods as well. All of these things can stimulate this reward pathway within the brain, which is the true meaning of addiction. And I want to separate this and distinguish this from dependency on any particular substance. So when we're talking about addiction, we're talking about repeated behaviors that are part of a reward system within the brain. And all of these things can do it that I display here on the slide. Addiction is a huge problem within the United States and, of course, within the world, but in affluent societies where there is sufficient amount of funds, then it's become more and more of a problem as people go to substances that can be abused and there's not the restrictions of cost generally involved. So one in seven during their lifetime are going to face addiction of one sort or, of a, or another, whether that's gambling or alcoholism or another drug uh, that they may be using, perhaps opioid. Over $450 billion are spent on a yearly basis to deal with this epidemic of addiction. It's, uh, and the number of associated problems are, are horrendous in terms of illnesses and death, of course. As, as many as one person almost every 15 minutes is dying as a result of opioid addiction. So a huge problem, and it's decimating our population, and especially the people who can be productive. Nevertheless, in spite of the seriousness of this problem, only 10% actually seek help and are able to receive help uh, for these types of problems. In addition, there's a very high relapse rate that goes uh, on with addiction very close tendency and common tendency to fall back on those old behaviors. Part of that has to do with the brain system and the reward system that's in the brain. The factors that lead to addiction are complex. It's not just one thing. It has to do with, of course, uh, the drugs, the environment, uh, some of the biological and the genetic makeup of each individual's and some of the predisposing factors that lead uh, to the use of drugs for self-treating uh, their one's particular problem. And all of these really converge on specific brain mechanism, mechanisms that uh, are going to reinforce or extinguish the pathways for reinforcement and reward. So as I said before, then we're we're really, we're talking about a reward system within the brain. And specifically, that area of the brain that controls this is the nucleus accumbens. Now, I've got that little red dot there that shows you that small little area is really what's controlling all of our rewards and our addictive behaviors, whatever they might be 
um, with, within our brain. It's a small area, but it is at a crossroads for the interaction for all the other areas of the brain. It's a reward system, and it's much different than we talk about with dependence. Because with dependence, when someone is on sufficient drugs, uh, that uh, then they don't have any craving. But when they are relieved uh, from that drug, when that drug level drops, then they need more and they have specific symptoms of withdrawal that comes with it. That's not what addiction is. Addiction is the craving of those pleasurable sensations that one has had before. It's actually been shown to be an epigenetic mechanism so that there are changes that are occurring in the DNA as a result of these particular behaviors and this reward system. It's focused on this one transcription factor that has been found over and over again to represent much of the addictive behavior. In fact, the preclinical work is measuring specifically this transcription factor to find out if it is the body's been stimulated into a reward situation or into an aversion situation just using this one particular transcription factor. Well, the conventional treatment for addiction has to do with abstinence. That's the primary thrust of what is being used. Then there are behavioral therapies, typically cognitive behavioral and in environmental uh, situations, as well as instructions and education. Drugs are used to counteract some of the side effects that somebody might be experiencing uh, with this or to calm them uh, as a result of some anxiety, or maybe there is a dependency on the drug and they're having associated symptoms that come with that. There are group uh, approaches uh, to addictions. Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12-step program, has been uh, fundamental in uh, this particular approach that has been very successful at sustaining people uh, from uh, going back to the addictive behavior and incarceration. Certainly this is the last thing that we want to do, whether it's hospitalization or whether it's uh, actually in a jail that would not allow for the full therapy that one would expect it would be needed to extinguish this kind of behavior in this reward system. Well, as you know, as you can imagine, then the endocannabinoid system is really a key function in this particular process. And part of the reason why is that the endocannabinoid system is, is that system that regulates our neurotransmitters as well as many of our emotions and our cravings and our, and our sensations. It's almost like a interpreting what's outside to what's inside and inside to what's outside. It provides that transition um, for what's going on between the two areas. There are clinical endocannabinoid deficiencies that occur in so many different conditions, uh, in, such as uh, migraines, uh, chronic fibromyalgia, and uh, for ir irritable bowel syndrome, all of these. And there's a host of others that are involved, including post-traumatic stress disorder. The causes for this deficiency can be anywhere from diet, drugs, toxins, all different types of things can produce that. In fact, there's clear evidence that some of the, our early encounters with childhood stress um, in terms of abusive situations or even trauma can lead to endocannabinoid dysfunction that predisposes us to other problems, perhaps addiction, perhaps post-traumatic stress disorder. What can we do to restore the endocannabinoid system? And I'll talk about that a little further on as what the primary therapies should be looking at restoring this system so the adequate tone is there so the body can recover and sustain itself in a healthy mode. The primary function of the endocannabinoid system is for maintaining homeostasis and regulation of all systems. In addiction, we're seeing the downregulation of the cannabinoid type 1 receptor. It's diminished, it's not functioning at its full potential. And in addition, there are disturbances in the binding so that the endocannabinoids within our body are not making the connections that they need to in order to affect specific action. 
In addiction, we're seeing dysregulation of the endocannabinoids. Sometimes that's elevation of anandamide, one of the endocannabinoids, or 2-AG. It might be decreased or depressed. And that's specific for different areas of the brain. So this is highly variable, and it depends on the addiction and the addiction substance that someone is encountering and what exactly is happening. But the final common pathway is going through uh, this particular uh, signaling system to, that's supposed to be maintaining homeostasis, but in this case, it's gotten out of balance as a result of inadequate tone or the irritating effects of some toxin. Perhaps that's one of the drugs that are being used. We know that this is the, the, the pathway because when people go into abstinence, we see a cannabinoid type 1 receptor recovery, and there's an improvement in the tone, but it may not be enough to prevent further addictive situations. Cannabidiol has some unique properties that are quite extraordinary. Number one, cannabidiol is, is inhibiting the sensitization. In other words, when people are exposed to a substance that is potentially addictive, that a lot of these substances, like opioids, actually make the body react more sensitively. There's a craving, craving for it and a greater sensitivity to other drugs of abuse. It opens the window for additional um, addictions as well as um, uh, disruptive behavior and sensitivity to that particular substance. In addition, we've got CBD is blocking reconsolidation. Now, you may have heard about reconsolidation with respect to PTSD previously when I've talked about it. This actually happens within the addictive uh, situation because remember, this is a reward pathway and the brain is using these associated cues in order to uh, signal um, additional cravings uh, for that substance or that behavior and reinforcement uh, for those particular addictions. Cannabidiol is blocking that reconsolidation phase, that part of the signaling in the brain that reinforces and continues to improve those pathways neurologically to those sections of the brain that provide that reward. Cannabidiol is inhibiting the drug-seeking behavior. This was specifically done in the case of heroin, where addicts are going after the drug. That behavior is significantly dampened. It's preventing cell death and a reduced brain volume that is associated with alcoholism, with amphetamines, and of a number of other drugs to drug substances. So that gives the potential for recovery when one gets away from the addiction. It's providing a sustained effect after treatment. In the case of nicotine, what the, uh, the studies have found is that even after the course of therapy with cannabidiol was completed, there was sustained avoidance uh, and lack of addictive symptoms with respect uh, to the nicotine substance. I suspect that's going to be true in several other substances as well. Furthermore, we see cannabidiol as inhibiting the anxiety, the epilepsy, and the brain injury that is clearly associated with alcoholism. When someone goes into alcoholic withdrawal, they sometimes are subjected to epileptic episodes as well as ischemic brain injury. In addition, we've got the effect on the liver for uh, cannabidiol with alcoholism, it damages the liver, and CBD is going to help uh, reduce the inflammation and stop that particular problem. So a host of benefits for CBD, but one more of significance is that specifically in addiction, CBD is inhibiting the formation of this, um, this substance called FOSB that actually uh, facilitates uh, some of the methylation that occurs on the DNA for those epigenetic changes. As a result of that, you're getting a dampening of the addictive symptoms at the nucleus of the cell and preventing the, the potentiation and even the continuation and perhaps the craving um, and recidivism that occurs with addictive substances. 
how much CBD should be used. For all patients, I recommend starting with 15 milligrams twice a day. For those people between 7 and 70, if they're under 7 or over 70, then we're really talking about a half dose. That's not, very hap that's not going to be very common in anybody who um, is under 7, of course. But there are patients who have been brought on to opioids and who are over 70, and this could be a valuable addition to their program in getting them away from those opioids. Titrate early and boldly to control the symptoms. You're focusing on the symptoms. Use enough of the CBD in order to control those symptoms, and then you're going to get the, the, the benefits in terms of reduction of the addictive symptoms as well as uh, preventing uh, those uh, craving symptoms that go on and in addition, what we see with cannabidiol is the prevention of the withdrawal and the uh, symptoms that can occur with um, these uh, withdrawal from these addictive substances, and cannabidiol can stop that. It comes in a number of different forms, and the duration of action is between 6 and 12 hours. Once again, it's an individual approach. Everybody has to find out exactly what works for them. In general, I recommend twice a day, and that works for the vast majority of individuals. Who should be using cannabidiol? Well, I think that anybody who is involved with a, an addictive substance should be using cannabidiol as a protection against the toxic effect of those addictive substances if that's part of the therapy that needs to be there. Many cases, cannabidiol can replace that therapy, anything that could be causing one of those problems. But in when somebody is going through the phase of uh, uh, eliminating or abstinence, then cannabidiol could tremendously facilitate that particular process and even permanently uh, redu reduce those cravings that one encounters um, and prevent that behavior in the future. So that we might be able to see a, um, an improvement in the recovery and the sustained recovery from addictions. Certainly people who are exposed to toxins or uh, have toxin levels that are at high risk or they have impaired organ function, whether it's heart or kidney or even liver, CBD is going to offer the best protection for any medical process or any withdrawal process that you're trying to get to avoid and eliminate addiction. CBD is effective for a broad range of other conditions and it can be most valuable in all of the ones that I've listed. Let me go over some of the things that we talked about today. Addiction is a huge burden on the entire nation and on the entire world. Endocannabinoid deficient is key and significant in this disorder. CBD addresses the pathways of addiction and far more. And it's supported by preclinical studies and significant number of practice. It has no significant adverse effects, unlike the drugs that are being used. It has no toxicity, no drug interactions, and cannabidiol is not addictive in any form. The dosing is modest. Fast results can be achieved very easily. So that's the end of my talk. I want to open it up for questions, um, uh, take some questions and answer them for you. It's been a pleasure for me to talk to you about cannabidiol in addiction. I think it offers a huge benefit uh, that could be achieved by so many uh, of our uh, people and in so many situations within our medical profession. So let me open it up for questions now.